I'm now happy to introduce Suzanne Flint. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on evaluating results with returning instructor Cindy Mediavia. This is the fifth course in our online fellowship series. And our, apologize, our apologies for having had to reschedule this webinar from last Thursday. Evidently, April Fools came early for all of us. So we appreciate the accommodations many of you have had to make to join us today live. And as always, the webinar will also be archived for those unable to attend. Hopefully you've all been able to at least look over all the course topics to date. Many of you have been participating very actively. Others of you have had to participate and vary your levels a bit, but we appreciate you all continuing to engage and participate in the fellowship as your schedule and time allow. We are currently in the process of posting all the archived course content sans the discussion forums to our Transforming Life After 50 website, making these resources permanently available to you and your colleagues. So no matter what your participation level has been, if you are at least familiar with each course's content, these resources will be easier to identify and access whenever you'd like to utilize them again in the future. And as soon as everything has been formally posted, we'll post an announcement on Ning. I also want to thank Carla Lane for her engaging course on volunteers. The course stimulated lots of interesting volunteer job descriptions as well as addressed a number of important issues related to utilizing volunteers. And as usual, Mary Ross and I will be assisting today's instructor, the returning Cindy Amedavia, by monitoring the chat and Q&A sections. And as noted, please be sure to differentiate your posts with comments to share or responses to Cindy's questions posted in chat and any questions specifically for Cindy to answer posted in Q&A. Although you won't be able to see everyone else's questions in Q&A, we'll make sure all the questions get to Cindy for a response. Now, let's welcome back Cindy. Hello, thanks Suzanne, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us again today on Monday, and again, thank you all for your patience last Thursday. I was thinking that last Thursday was a good example of formative evaluation in that those of, uh, those of us behind the scenes very quickly were evaluating whether or not to proceed on Thursday. And of course, within a not too long a period, we decided to revamp or regroup and offer the, work, the uh, webinar today and let you all do other things on Thursday, thus improving uh, our service to you by bringing you all along today instead of forcing you to sit through uh, torturous uh, non-response uh, last Thursday. So anyway, if you don't know what formative evaluation is, you will know by the end of today. Okay, so what else are we going to be talking about today other than formative evaluation? Well, we're going to look at why we should do evaluations, why we should evaluate library services, what techniques we should use, possible challenges or issues that we might encounter or consider when deciding how to proceed with our evaluations, how to share our findings with stakeholders and other people who are interested in our services. And then at the end, I will impart some words of wisdom to, I hope, encourage you to proceed with evaluating your baby boomer programs. But let's start first with a definition. Uh, back in November, we did talk about community assessment and how that's something that's done before planning library services. Evaluation, however, is done during or after a service or program is offered. When we evaluate, we're not only evaluating whether we accomplished what we set out to do, but we're also measuring how effective our program is or was. So in other words, we are not only looking at what we've accomplished as far as how many people came to our programs and things like that, but we are also looking to see how our services benefited our target population, and in this case, uh, the baby boomer community. And this is why the number one reason why we should do evaluations is to measure the results and benefits of our services. But we also want to identify weaknesses, uh, not only looking back 
at the service that we provided to see how we might do it better next time, but also as we're going along in our service or our program uh, to make sure that we're on target. And so evaluation is also used to monitor program progress. Once we've identified what we've accomplished, uh, hopefully a lot of benefits of our services, we can then use those to promote the same or similar services or to promote library services in general. Uh, this is especially important today when we are really having to justify our existence or certainly having to justify why we need money for particular services, one way to do that is to do solid evaluation of the services that we do provide and then share the benefits of those services with potential funders. Uh, we also should use evaluation to set service priorities. This process helps us set priorities by indicating which services should be continued or replicated or which services should be dropped. We can't afford to be everything to everybody. And the way that we can figure out which services we might not want to offer any longer is to do evaluation. And finally, evaluation might be required by the funding body, by your city council or uh, board of supervisors, but especially by any agencies that provide you with grant funds. And in fact, I'm sure if you've gotten a grant, you have, you're familiar with having to do quarterly reports or six-month reports in addition to doing a year-end report. These reports and uh, requirements by the funding body or to make sure that you are spending their money the way that you said you would. So evaluation helps us with that. Now, when are evaluations conducted? Oh, that's my, OK. They're conducted, we're most familiar with doing evaluations at the end of a service or a program, and that's called summative evaluation because we're summing up what we have accomplished in our program or service. But equally important are formative evaluations, which are conducted while the service is going on to make sure that the library is on track. If it's not, then it's time to make some changes to bring the service back on track to meet the needs of your community. Uh, the best example of this that I could come up with is not a library example at all. If you were a piano teacher, you wouldn't wait till the recital to start having your student make changes to how he or she plays a particular piece. You want to make changes along the way so that you're providing the best service as possible and to help form a better service. And so that's why this is called formative evaluation. Now, when do we design our evaluations? That's a really good uh, question. Um, we should do that when we uh, are providing, when we're getting our, um, oh, excuse me, I just lost my place. We should, we should design our evaluations uh, when we are putting our, uh, pro when we are designing our programs. One of the biggest complaints people often have uh, after they've conducted an evaluation is that they didn't really learn anything new from the evaluation, and gee, what a big waste of time. Uh, I suspect that when that happens, it's because the evaluation was not designed at the beginning when you were, when you were designing your program. Uh, in fact, often evaluations conducted as an afterthought. Oh, we better evaluate this program because the funder or city council wants to know how it went and was not planned along the way. You must design your evaluation the same time you design your program. And you do that through setting objectives and outcomes. 
Now, I talk extensively about objectives and outcomes in the course, but let me just review very quickly. Objectives are SMART. They're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, relevant, and time-bound. You want to have objectives that are specific and relevant to the program or service that you are providing. You also want to have your uh, objectives be measurable, which means the statements themselves include some sort of number or quantity that can be measured. So if you're offering a health uh, lecture series about boomers' health, you and you uh, want to set an objective, one of your objectives might be that 75 people will attend, the uh, total 75 people will attend the service or the uh, series. That is a number that's quantifiable. You can measure at the end of the series whether or not 75 people attended. So that's a pretty easy, uh, objectives tend to be rather easy to measure if there's a good solid number in there. They should also be time bound, which means the ideal would be you have a start and an end date on your objective, but at minimum you should have an end date to your objective so you know when to expect results, which would be the end of your health lecture series would possibly be the end date for your objective. Outcomes, of course, are a little more complicated. They're more difficult to express and measure because they tend to indicate, well, not tend, they should indicate a positive change in a person's skills, knowledge, attitude, behavior, condition, or life status. And since you have a positive change, that means that outcomes represent benefits. Outcomes also must be measurable and so usually are expressed numerically, but instead of just counting the number of people who participated in a program, with outcomes you're counting how many people benefited from that program. Remember, outcomes equal benefit, some sort of positive change in a person's life. Your outcome statement then should be written in anticipation of specific benefits to be gained by the program. And you want to express outcomes in specific language. Obviously, we want all people to be healthier as a result of attending our uh, healthy lecture series. That's way too broad. You're going to need to make a quantitative, uh, more specific outcome, for instance, you're hoping that 40% of the people who attend your healthy body lecture series will stop using caffeine. That is very specific and it's very measurable and it w it, if it, it's achieved, that will be a benefit to the people who abandon the use of caffeine. The neat thing about outcomes is that if you have really good ones that you write, they will then help you design your program so that you achieve those outcomes. So if you say 40% of your people who attend the Healthy Living Lecture Series will stop using caffeine, then that will make you, well, will sort of force you to include a lecture about caffeine and the dangers of caffeine in your program. If you don't mention caffeine, then it's hard to have that as an outcome because you haven't specifically addressed that in your program. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Outcomes should inform how you carry out your program. And because both objectives and outcomes are measurable, they should also be the basis for how you conduct your evaluation because you want to create evaluation that will then measure whether or not you accomplished your objectives and your outcomes. Therefore, ergo, it's, it's critical that you design your evaluation the same time you're designing your objectives and your outcomes, and 
at the same time designing your program. So Stephen has a, a, a question here. Would you provide an example of how I might design, conduct a formative evaluation after engaging my library community in PLA 50 and initiating strategies identified in your community assessment? Uh, let's say you pull together a job, so you, you've assessed your community, and the number one thing that they're concerned about is finding jobs, and so you create a job center. Instead of waiting six months into that particular program or at the evaluating it at the end of the year because you've gotten grant funds and the, the funder is requiring that you do a year-end report, you want to measure pretty early on, maybe after a handful of weeks, a month, two months into it, to see if the job center actually is meeting the needs of your community instead of waiting to the end. And so you would possibly survey people or do uh, uh, you might observe them using the center or do one-on-one -on -one interviews with them as they you know, get up and leave or while they're sitting there. You could uh, ask them, uh, how valuable is this uh, career center, this job center for you? Is it helping you? Write, uh, uh, organize your resume. Is it helping you find jobs, et cetera? Does that help, Stephen? Does that is that a good example? Do, does anyone else have a question about this? Because this really, it's, sometimes it's hard to get your head around. Well, gee, evaluations often happen at the end. Why do I have to create them at the beginning when they're not going to happen until six months from now? Any questions about that? I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to move ahead. But if you do come up with questions, uh, I'll get back to this, because it's really a critical uh, part of doing your evaluations. I do have a question for you all, and that is, oh my, where are my on the questions? I'm so sorry. Uh, what is, in, in chat, what methods have you used to evaluate successfully your programs? What uh, evaluation techniques have you used to successfully measure your services and programs? So tell us in chat. And while you're doing that, I will go ahead and um, talk about the probably the methods that you're most familiar with. And that would be, of course, surveys would be the number one, I'm guessing, from your comments on uh, Moodle, that surveys are uh, what most of you are familiar with. The trick with surveys, of course, is to solicit responses only for the information that you need to know to measure the success of your program. Sometimes we get a little carried away and start throwing in all kinds of other kinds of questions. Um, don't do it. You want to keep to the point. You want to have short surveys. Uh, and don't use this as an opportunity to test out all the different types of survey questions that we learned about back in November. Use two or three at the most. Um, yes, no's, open-ended. Uh, ranking, multiple choice. Don't use all of them. Use two or three types of questions. The same thing with focus groups. You want to stick to the topic that you're wanting to measure. You don't want to go hog wild with um, all kinds of other questions. Well, gee, we have this group of people in the room. Let's ask them about other things, too. No, stick to the topic at hand. You want to, again, going back to November when we talked about focus groups, six to ten homogeneous people. That would be a group of grandparents who care for their grandchildren, a group of baby boomer women, a group of baby boomer men. You don't want to mix up the groups. If you want a good, diverse group of people, then, add, then pull together separate focus groups to do that. And how many focus groups should you uh, lead? Well, until you start hearing the same answers over and over again, then you've reached critical mass and you don't need to do more than that. The other two methods we talk about in the course are counting 
outputs, which you should be very familiar with. That's collecting statistics. These are hard figures that help put other evaluation findings into perspective. Um, we do a really good job at collecting statistics, but the statistics on their own don't usually stand up all that well. They need to be put into a broader context, so I would highly recommend that you mix it up. Do counting outputs as well as surveys or focus groups, or my personal favorite, which is observation, where you watch as events actually unfold, and then record what you saw and heard. So it's not just you observing, it's you also then writing down notes as to what you saw so that you can later go back to those notes to see what themes and patterns emerge. And the observation is excellent for confirming or even refuting the findings of your other evaluation techniques. An example of that would be you hold a program, you do a survey, 99% of the people say the program was wonderful, yet you were there and you noticed that people were fidgeting and most of the time they were on their iPhones or they, they half the people left or whatever. Um, that would be a case of the observation not necessarily jibing with what you saw in the survey and then you would have to justify, figure out what actually happened there. So what uh, I think Suzanne or, or Mary, you're tallying what uh, people, what techniques people use successfully? Yes, I am, Cindy. I've been uh, taking a look at the chat messages posted and it seems like there are a lot of people who've been using surveys. Uh, Terry Gilbert mentions post-program surveys. Sally Thomas, paper surveys handed out at events. Terry Beck mentions paper forms, online questionnaires being used. Sue Walker um, mentioned surveys. Sue also mentioned focus groups that they're using. And I noticed a couple people mentioned focus groups. Sue mentioned that. Um, Marshall Shapiro mentioned focus groups. Mm -hmm. Marshall, if you could, he's saying he's planning a, a focus group meeting in May. And Marshall, if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Is that targeted specifically to midlife, to programs for midlife adults? Can you give us a little more detail in the chat about the focus groups? Um, Marshall also says that you were very helpful to him, Cindy, in assisting him in developing questions for yes. that focus group meeting they're planning in May. Yes, well, thank so, you, Marshall, for, for uh, that plug. And I'm happy to, again, I know I've mentioned this many times when we were in person in September, et cetera. I'm happy to help you with any instruments that you are trying to put, put together, and I'm happy to critique and give you input. Uh, even after we're all done meeting, I'm, I'm, you know, I enjoy doing this. So please feel free to call on me if you need my help. And then um, let's see, there's some more mentions of surveys. Sharon Ballard mentions using a short and simple pre and post survey for their computer class good. participants. Yeah, good. And um, short written survey, Garrett mentions at the end of every program or class. Um, Valerie mentions summative surveys as well. Okay. And then a few people are mentioning the uh, use of observation mm -hmm. and head counts. Christine yeah. Mackey mentions head counts and observation. Dale Savage mentions observation. Uh, Colleen Shaw also mentions counts, counting attendees. And Mary Wise mentions counting outputs and observation. And um, yes, and Marshall's also saying about the focus group in May that um, the it's baby boomers related. There's an incentive for people to attend it, mm -hmm. and the meeting is specifically to find new program ideas to attract baby boomers to mm -hmm. to the library. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, good. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of experience, um, but yeah, it sounds like surveys. And of course, counting outputs are those are the two that I think most people are familiar with, which is fine. I think you can do a lot with what you already know. Uh, the power comes in when you combine both those uh, techniques as opposed to just doing numbers or even just doing surveys as powerful as, as surveys can be. 
let's try to figure out what methodologies are the best, because that often is uh, quite a challenge. If you've been following along on the course, you notice that I cite this article by Carter McNamara quite a bit, uh, and I would highly recommend that you link to it and look through it, because he, he does a good job of explaining these things almost in a much simpler way than, than I do. But what he's emphasizing here in this particular quote is that you want to use methods that are cost-effective, realistic, doable, and that provide you with the most useful information. So let's look at some of the things to consider when trying to figure out which methods are the best ones for your particular um, project that you're trying to, to evaluate and measure the effectiveness of. The number one thing, of course, is what methods will get you the data needed to evaluate your program's success? And I'm going to recommend that you use a combination of methods. I think certainly you should do counting output, something that will give you numbers. And then you also need to use a technique that will help you describe the benefits derived, which means actually asking people what benefits they got out of your service or your program, which means either a focus group or some sort of survey. Uh, again, the combination of the techniques really gives you, can give you some really powerful uh, data. Just as uh, McNamara mentioned, you also want to make sure that you're looking uh, for methods that are the most cost effective and effortless. And I would say that that would be also considering who should conduct the evaluation. Is it cheaper for you, for you just to do it? Or do you want to train staff and volunteers to do it? Volunteers being free, but you still have to train them, uh, which may be all, that whole thing might be more expensive than just you doing it. Or maybe the cheapest way, which you may go, wait a minute, that can't be possible. But maybe the cheapest way would be actually to hire a consultant who knows how to do evaluation uh, and doesn't have to be trained just needs a description of what the project is, and then that person would probably say, oh, these are the best methods, and then he or she would go ahead and do it, write the reports for you. So these are all things to think about, the most cost-effective, effortless, and you know who actually should do it. You also want to choose methods that are going to provide accurate, thorough, and credible data. I think all the methods that we talk about in the course will give you accurate and thorough data if you do them right. Um, the credibility is another thing altogether. Counting outputs, giving statistics and uh, survey results, excuse me, I'm going to cough, tend to be very credible. People uh, tend to believe those kind of uh, findings. Excuse me. Um, focus groups, a little softer on the data. People feel like, well, you know, you're talking about people's impressions here. I'd like to see that combined with maybe some numbers. And the softest of all, although it happens to be my favorite way of uh, evaluating services, is observation. The, the people reading my report, for instance, might say, well, Cindy, very thorough and you describe all the details, but you know, it, it is your impression of what was going on. Gee, why didn't you ask the people who were actually participating in the program what they thought was going on? So again, a combination. You want some numbers, you want that people will believe, and then you want also um, a, a, a bunch of different, different approaches to the issue so that the, the information that you present is credible. You also want to choose methods that won't alienate your participants. In my household, I am famous for wanting to always do all the surveys when we get uh, people on the telephone. My husband will automatically hand me the phone. Here, it's for you. It's a survey. I really like surveys. I, I like participating in them because I am always looking at them, trying to uh, steal techniques that, that they're using and seeing things that they do wrong that I want to make sure that I don't do in my surveys. But even me, who loves doing surveys, if I'm walking up to my supermarket and I see someone with a clipboard out there, 
I'm going to go in the other door because I don't have time right then to be doing surveys. So we want to make sure that we're using techniques that aren't going to alienate or bother our, our customers. So that's another thing to consider. We also don't want to over-collect data because then you're going, to be too, you're going to be stuck with too much stuff to analyze, and that's bad. That may even put you off altogether from even doing the analysis, or once you do it, you're going to say, ick, I don't ever want to do evaluation again. That was way, way too hard. So you do want to limit to one or two possibly methodologies or use samples so that you don't have too much uh, data to analyze. I'm going to give you an example of that, but as I am doing that, why don't you give us in chat, tell us about some challenges that you've encountered or things that you've had to consider um, when conducting evaluations that you've done. What are some of the problems or things that you have had to think about or overcome while you've conducted evaluations? And let me give you the example that I have of the over over collecting data. Uh, a student approached me a couple of weeks ago and said that she had been asked by her internship site to evaluate whether people were getting the information that they needed at the library. And so she had decided a good way to evaluate that would be to stand in the lobby and ask people as they were leaving the library one-on-one -on -one, a certain set of questions. Did you find what you needed today? If, uh, what were you hoping to find that you didn't find this kind of thing? And she said she was going to do that. Either she was going to do it or a friend of hers was going to do it every hour that the library was open over a one-week span. So I told her, well, I love the idea of the clipboard and the one-on-one -on -one interviews, exit interviews, uh, but every hour that the library is open, you're going to have a fit with yourself that you were too thorough in collecting the data because there's going to be far too much data to analyze. So we decided that perhaps one morning, one afternoon, one evening, and either Saturday or Sunday, or an hour, and that should be plenty data to be able to let her, her supervisor know uh, whether people had been finding what they needed or not. So what are some of the issues, Mary, that uh, people are coming up with? Well, Cindy, that question just unleashed, <laughs> unleashed a, a number of chat comments, and I'm going to try to organize them. Okay for you. Uh, a number of people mentioned the right wording for the questions. That was mentioned by Shana, Colleen, yes. several people. Um, the right wording for the questions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you don't forget you want to focus you you're asking questions to get at the specific information that you need to know whether you've succeeded or not in the program. Okay, and then uh, and some very interesting um, comments by Terry Beck. Things seem to be extreme, either very good or very bad. She's curious about those in the middle. How do you get responses from, how do you get an uh, accurate indication of those who are in the middle? So I'm, I'm, I'm not, under, can you repeat it again? I'm not understanding what the question is. Or what sure, and Terry, is. you may want to give us a little more detail in chat. Also, Terry Beck says, um, the responses seem to be extreme. Things to be seem to be extreme, either very good or very bad. And she's curious about those in the middle, the person who indicates the middle rating, and then maybe doesn't give a comment to yeah, it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, researchers want one end or the other. If if it's in the middle, that usually means they don't have any sort of opinion. So, actually, you might. It might be kind of scary to have extremes on one end or the other. That actually is good because those that means there are some opinions. If they're in the middle, that often means that there's no opinion, and that's not very helpful, actually. I hope that answers what you're asking. Other and she may give us some more. Oh, here it is. Okay. She gave us a little more detail. People tell you when it's wonderful or they pick it apart, and uh, she's wondering about those 
in in the middle of ratings were they happy or satisfied with the program okay well you probably didn't <clears throat> you probably didn't ask the uh, the question that they actually would have answered one way or the other mhm mm so they're coming in the middle uh, i don't know if i'm expressing it the way you want the information that you need but truly um that has to do with the way you structure the question mhm mm then a number of people are mentioning get the participation, getting people to participate in uh, evaluations, lack of participation. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing um, a large community event, getting people to do a survey at the end, families are ready to leave. They don't always want to take the time right. to do that. Like your example in, by the supermarket, not having necessarily the time. Exactly. Uh, oh, getting people to return to the surveys as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, returning the surveys. Um, yeah, so maybe that means surveys are not the best way to, to try to evaluate what's going on with these particular folks. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to rely mostly on observations or um, trying to get at least, uh, not expecting a, everyone to do surveys, but to get a good sample. Maybe that's what you need to do instead of expecting everyone to do it. And that may be an answer, too, that applies to uh, something that Marshall Shapiro just uh, put in the text chat as well, that um, surveys at the end of a workshop or class, sometimes people are so overwhelmed, they're tired after right. the program, they may be right. overwhelmed with data, they don't necessarily always answer right. accurately or truthfully. Right, exactly. So maybe you want to survey them later, especially with something like a uh, Oh, computer workshop or something where people are learning skills. Uh, you want them actually, they probably would consider it fun to do the surveys on the computer if, if, to utilize the skills that they just learned. And maybe you collect their emails and you send the survey to them a few days later when they have thought about things and they're not so stressed out because they just finished a and two hour I class. Can I jump in, too, for a second, um, mm -hmm. uh, Cindy, because I also was noticing, and I wonder how you feel about this, you know, a couple of folks were commenting about the halo effect, the fact oh, yeah. that um, people tend to tell you what you want to hear. Right. What do you feel about the idea of maybe then it might be useful to use a volunteer as the survey giver or someone who's not a library person? Does that sort of help, do you think? Mm, I don't think it helps with the halo effect. Okay. They're still going to answer the survey probably positively. Uh -huh. I think that's why, where uh, observations really help. Okay. Where you can actually, you know, if you're a real astute observer, you can tell whether people are engaged or not. Um, you know, if they're on their phones or they're looking at their iPad the whole time, they're not engaged. And even if the surveys come back 99% positive, your, your own eyes tell you that, eh, they weren't necessarily that enthused about this because they were way distracted by other things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Rebecca's asking uh, or mentioning something a little bit different also, Cindy, about um, if you have a program and the attendance is so low, it's difficult to determine um, what the evaluation is actually telling you about how the, the program could be improved. Well, if, you know, depending how, how how low the evaluation or the participation is, I might actually do a debrief at the end and just say, um, so I would send the the guest the speaker away or whatever, um, so that they could feel like they could speak candidly, especially if you were concerned that in your you let's say you observed it and you thought, eh, this didn't really work that well. Um, I would send the presenter out of the room and just say, you know, we really want to do the best here. Can you give us some feedback on how we could do better, that kind of thing? And if the group is small enough, they probably will engage in a conversation, and that might be all the kind of uh, evaluation that you get, but it, that might be a pretty good evaluation, especially if the intent is to try to improve or maybe everyone will say, no, this was fabulous, and that might be good enough. And let's see, I'm, go I'm still going through the comments. And if I miss any, Suzanne, please pull out ones that I'm missing here. Um, 
Let's see. Oh, and, and Erica mentions uh, incentives, having a carrot for completing the evaluation, and that's, that's right. been effective yeah. for them as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Good, good. I see some people asking about satisfaction. Satisfaction is a really tricky thing to try to measure, and in fact, when I was first deciding how to pull this course together, I thought I would include a module on satisfaction, it's a really hard thing to try to measure. I would recommend that instead of satisfaction, you try to measure something else, like um, what did you learn from this workshop, or um, you know, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on specific things, but satisfaction is often a very fuzzy and that's really where you sometimes get into the halo effect, where even if people didn't learn all that much, they may just be satisfied that they were in a room full of other people. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to, I would really steer away from the satisfaction questions. And then Dale, Dale made a comment, and uh, I may ask him to clarify that a little bit more in the chat as well. He's talking about a bimodal distribution. And I'm assuming, Dale, that you mean the distribution between the extreme responses, either very high ratings or very low ratings. And he says that can indicate that more than one population is using the service. Is, oh. is that correct, Dale? If you can clarify that, that will really help. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, um, he's I think going to give an example in chat also, Cindy, okay, so we'll perfect. wait wait for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm going to move on because we do have some more things to cover, um, and the time is, I see that the time is drawing close. So let me go ahead and move on, and then um, we can always return to the chat. Um, okay, so, let, so you've collected your data, then what do you do with it? Well, the first thing you're going to do is draw conclusions. And this is where you actually look at the numbers, you look at the survey responses, et cetera, and you note themes and uh, patterns that emerge. The evaluation actually doesn't happen until you compare your conclusions to the goals, objectives, and outcomes that you originally set when you designed the, the program or the service. The comparison between what actually happened and what you hoped would happen, that is the evaluation. Now, hopefully, you will find out that you achieved your outcomes and your objectives, and so then, yippee, you uh, had a very successful program uh, or service. If, however, you fall short, uh, it's not the end of the world. What I would do is I would look at my evaluation. Did we do a good evaluation, or was there something weird with the instrument? Did we not ask the right questions to get at the information that we needed? Did we not use uh, the right techniques? Um, and then if it, and indeed it was your evaluation that kind of went wacky, then I would say salvage what you can with what you found out, use that to sort of evaluate the success uh, or the, the lack of success, and then move on, and next time you do an evaluation, do a better job of it. If, however, there's nothing wrong with the evaluation, you really scrutinize it, maybe it's just a case of you, uh, your expectations were too high and you fell short. And, the exam uh, and so you look at that to see what might have gone wrong. And the example that we use in the course, in the high, our hypothetical rock and roll series is that one of our objectives is that we hope that 20 people will sign up for library cards as a result of attending that particular series. In our hypothetical, only seven people sign up for library cards. So we look at that and we go, ah, I know what happened here. Only seven people signed up for library cards because everyone else are already library users who are attending this series. And next time, we need to do a better job of reaching out to non-users in order to uh, reach the particular objective of the 20 library card sign-up. So that's, that is what happens when you do the evaluation. It helps you figure out how you succeeded and also where some of the shortcomings are. Now, I'm going to share, we're going to talk about how you share your results, the good and the bad. Um, but as we, as I'm talking about these, why don't you let us know also through chat your favorite ways of sharing program results? 
So very quickly, <clears throat> you may want to write a, a, a big final report that talks about what you learned, how you succeeded, recommendations for the future. You may want to do an executive summary that's, that is just bullet points of some of the things that would have been in the final report. I'm sure all of you are familiar with media releases, uh, writing press releases, or um, uh, releasing the, the information to other uh, sources that will then uh, tell what uh, how your program went to, how, how your program went. Oral presentations, especially to your community members, especially if you're going to be soliciting funds for future programs, brochures, posting a video on your website or YouTube so the whole world knows uh, about how wonderful your program was. And then, of course, I would encourage all of you to do conference presentations to your colleagues. And this is where you really talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly so that they learn from what you did well and also from what didn't go so well so they don't repeat your mistakes. So how let's hear how you all, your favorite ways of sharing the information. Mary. Well, Cindy, things are still being typed into the chat box. Um, Terry Beck mentions that it depends on who needs to have the information. Yes, and excellent. she mentions summaries and pertinent data to supervisors and community relations. Mm -hmm. Alan is mentioning oral presentation with a sample of the program to give a real flavor of the program. Good. Uh, Terry mentions written, ter this is Terry Gilbert, written and oral reports. Um, Chris, this is an interesting comment that Christine Mackey is making. She says she prefers to do a written report, but her manager prefers oral presentations, different hmm. communication styles. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Good. And Rebecca says informal oral reports, and she likes the discussion that can stem from those. Uh, okay. Jeff Kemp mentions articles in the staff newsletter and reports on the intranet, staff intranet. Excellent. Yeah, I love that. And Karen Spiel mentions sharing results of successful programs at local citizens' meetings, district councils, mm -hmm. neighborhood councils, et cetera, mm -hmm. because the citizens themselves spread the word about what the library is doing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, Sally's mentioning posting photos is helpful to show library administrators and others who are not present how well the event was attended mm -hmm. and to Excellent. get a feel for the event. It brings it, brings it to life, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Good. And Barbara Wolf mentions communicating with staff about the success and how important their, pre their participation was. That's very reinforcing. Mm -hmm. uh, compiling a notebook, this is Deborah Peterson, compiling a notebook, photos, sample programs, comments of participants. Good. Good. And, and photos on Flickr. Flickr. Sally Thomas mentions that. That's a great way to distribute them. Right. And Good. Marshall Shapiro, in addition to the written and oral reports for meetings, mentions testimonials from participants that can be included in reports as well as videos and photos Excellent. showing Excellent. participation. Excellent. And actually, that leads. That's a great segue to the last slide that I have, which is final words of advice. Uh, the first. Were, the first bullet is don't be afraid to evaluate services. We are, as a profession, are brilliant at providing services. We're less brilliant at evaluating or measuring the effectiveness of our services, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're having such problems now because we're having to justify um, why we even exist. And if we did good, solid evaluation, of what we do accomplish and share that information widely, then I think we might have a better chance of competing for very limited uh, budgets right now. So I want to, uh, you know, I really do want to encourage you to, to evaluate your services. Um, you don't have to create evaluation plans that are complicated. Make them simple but effective. Also, include the human element. Include photographs. Include observations, anecdotes. Funders may like to see good, strong numbers, but unless you have anecdotes and photographs and uh, the human element in there, you, the numbers don't take on any sort of life. So you really want to include all that stuff. So thank you for reminding us about the importance of photographs. Uh, report failures as well as success, because we do learn from our shortcomings. 
and it shows that you are willing to make improvements uh, from the mistakes that that uh, that you learned about in the last time that you did the, this particular program. And finally, use the data, uh, the evaluation data, to improve your services. Don't just collect the data and then let them sit there. You really need to do something with them. So any other, I know we zoomed through this, uh, but it really was a recap of all three weeks. So any other comments or questions, anything else people want to contribute? I'm not seeing any questions come through, though one of the things that I might, um, I actually posted something in chat, Cindy, when people were talking about folks with yeah. sort of a range of skills. And so I thought maybe if you could just talk for a second of why um, sort of use of pre and post surveys, especially for like a computer class, might yeah. help address that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, especially when measuring outcomes which show change, a positive change, you could ask the same, you could do the same quiz before and after, let's say, a computer class to measure, to ask them what their different, you know, you ask, uh, do a quiz that asks questions that measure their skill level with different aspects about computers. Then you ask the same questions at the end of the workshop and hopefully you will get the, the post-workshop uh, survey will demonstrate that they actually learn things that they didn't know on the pretest. I hope that's making sense. So a pretest and a post-test, if administered correctly, should show, and, and if the workshop was good, <laughs> uh, should show a gain in knowledge uh, when you do the post Survey. So that's an excellent way. A pre and post uh, test is an excellent way to measure a change in um, knowledge and skill base. Does that help? Did that answer your question, Suzanne? Yeah, I think that's great. And I, I think the point that I was also trying to make is I think what the value of that is when you have a, a group with a wide range of skills. Yeah. Essentially, they're com they're they're comparing their change to themselves. Exactly. And so some people who are very skilled may still have a change. It may be different, though, than the change of people who have more basic skills who are coming into the class, and that's why that's an advantage to use that as a technique. So, yes, yes Excellent. you helped clarify that, I that's think. Good, Thanks. Good. I see one other comment also, Cindy, from Sue Walker. She says she thinks it's important to know the type of data that the funders Excellent. want mm -hmm. and mentions that she had a supervisor who did not give any credibility to anecdotal information yes. because he said that's just one person. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That's why that list that said uh, accurate, thorough, and credible, you need to figure out, especially if you're doing a report for funders or supervisors, what they consider credible. Again, my favorite way of doing it is observation, but other people may be like, uh-uh, that's not going to fly here. We want more solid data from surveys and uh, counts and things like that. Very good point. And there is, a, uh, there is a question here from Alan Byrne, also Cindy. Do you think evaluation needs to be taken to a next level of outreach and politics to attain the results we need to make our profession stronger? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking, Alan, but I think evaluation helps justify why we exist and why we should exist, and that once you... Uh, and you can use those data and the, that justification, then you can make it political or you can, you know, I, I think that's what you're getting at. But I think w evaluation is one way to make the library uh, more viable in the eyes of p people who do hold the purse strings and who are the politicos. I hope that's answering it. Okay, good. Any other questions? Comments? I think that's about it. Mary, did you see anything else posted? 
No, and I, I just wanted to say quickly, if we missed a, a particular comment or question that you typed in the text chat, for me, when I was reading the text chat messages, if you were still typing them, they were scrolling. <laughs> it made it very difficult to read because they scrolled right off of my screen. So if I missed a, a comment or question, please type it into the text chat again. Thank well, you. And, and I would also encourage people to use Moodle for some yeah. of these issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, this particular course is ending today, I guess. Uh, but I know that I'm going to continue uh, engaging with you well after today uh, about evaluating results. So please use Moodle, too, to express some of your uh, comments and questions. Yeah. Well, thanks, Cindy. I think welcome. this has been You're a <laughs> really stimulating presentation. Got lots of good conversation going on, and I agree with you. Um, we can look forward to continuing these conversations back in Moodle. The next two weeks is still a catch-up period for folks um, on this course, and you know, as um, Cindy has generously offered, she's also available to those of you, you know, um, for longer if you want to stay connected to her or have questions about this particular class. So thanks, everyone, for your participation. We're looking forward to the next webinar, which is going to be the concluding course in the fellowship. That webinar will be with Jane Salisbury and Annalisa Svehog on April 28th. And then, of course, in June, June 16th, I believe, we're going to have our concluding webinar for the whole fellowship. Can you believe it? We're coming down here to the, the end of the year together almost. So anyway, thanks, everybody, for another very engaging webinar with lots of good conversation, and we'll continue to keep it going in Moodle.